Hello, I'm Peter Van Dusen, and this is Primetime Politics, the campaign edition. Day six of the federal election race, and the three main party leaders fanning out across the Prairie Provinces today with a focus on promises about job creation, paid sick leave, and Indigenous issues. Coming up, candidates will be here to debate the latest election developments, and our panel of parliamentary journalists will give us their assessment of week one, the issues, the performance of the leaders, and more. But first, the day on the campaign trail. Liberal leader Justin Trudeau campaigned in Manitoba and Saskatchewan today. At a stop in Winnipeg, Trudeau met with frontline workers at a grocery store before promising a re-elected Liberal government will introduce 10 days of paid sick leave for all federally regulated workers within the first 100 days of taking office. And he promised to pressure the provinces to do the same. We're setting the standard for what people deserve and we'll convene the provinces to talk about how to make sick leave a reality in provincially regulated sectors too. If you're sick, you should be able to stay home and get well. It's as simple as that. Justin Trudeau also faced continuing questions about the slow pace of Canada's efforts to evacuate Afghans and their families from Afghanistan. Trudeau rejected suggestions this election campaign has taken the government's attention away from the crisis in that country. Uh, I get briefings every day. Our ministers continue to work uh, day in and day out on this important file. Uh, I think Canadians know that our system of government is strong, our democracy is strong, uh, and we are able to continue to engage in this unbelievably important foreign policy measure because uh, we've been working on it now uh, for many, many weeks. Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole was also on the prairies today, making campaign stops in Winnipeg and Saskatoon. O'Toole's focus today was on his party's promise to recover one million jobs lost during the pandemic. That includes a promise to pay up to 50% of the salary of new job hires at any business for six months to help get workers back on the job. Our top priority is getting as many people back to work in good jobs in every part of Canada, in every sector, as quickly as possible. We will not leave Canadian workers behind. And O'Toole was pressed by reporters to clarify his position on his platform promise to protect health care professionals who refuse to provide certain procedures such as medically assisted death or abortion because of their personal beliefs. When he sought the party leadership last year, O'Toole also promised to protect the rights of health professionals to refuse to refer a patient to someone else. Today, O'Toole said referrals would be required. Yes, they will have to refer because... The rights to access those services exist across the country. And this is about striking a reasonable balance. Um, and as we see medical assistance in dying expanded, there are some concerns for some in our healthcare sector, and we can, we can balance those, those concerns off, but not deny services. The NDP leader, too, was in Saskatchewan today and focused his campaign on the challenges facing Canada's Indigenous communities. Jagmeet Singh visited the Kawasas First Nation, site of the recent discovery of 751 unmarked graves near a former residential school. Soon to be a new father, Singh became emotional when considering the damage First Nations families have suffered. We have a responsibility and an obligation to make sure that we are not just funding the healing, but we are funding communities that are dealing with that trauma, that we are assisting in every way possible to heal that trauma, and we recognize that it is directly causing poverty, it is directly causing substance abuse, it's directly causing all sorts of harms, and it is our responsibility to set that right. Singh also attacked the Prime Minister's promise of paid sick leave for federal workers, saying it should have come 18 months ago at the beginning of the pandemic. In the midst of an election, he announces it, like some sort of present, this is something that should have happened 18 months ago. It is cynical politics at its worst, and it's frankly disgusting that he did not do this early and waited to an election to now announce it. Bloc Québécois leader Yves-François Blanchet focused on climate change in a Quebec community that has faced repeated flooding. He accused the Liberals of not doing enough to end the dependence on fossil fuels. But he bristled when a reporter pointed out that Quebec is still a major consumer of fossil fuels to drive its economy. Quebec can do better. Quebec must do better. And I understand that Quebec wants to do better. Quebec would also accept to be helpful, to support, and even to pay a part of what would be required 
in order to help other jurisdictions to do better. But please, do not compare the performance of Quebec in terms of climate change to the performance of Alberta. The Green Party leader was also focused on climate change today. Annemie Paul outlined her party's five-point plan to reach net zero emissions. All of these things together, combined with political will, combined with the ambition and determination of the people of Canada, can ensure that when we have our next election, that Canada is known globally as a leader in research and development, in deep decarbonization, in reducing greenhouse gases, because we are not going to leave the future to pay for the decisions we delayed today. And that's the kind of day it's been, day six of the campaign. Well, let's bring in three candidates now to discuss the latest developments on the campaign trail today. Terry Duguid is the Liberal candidate for re-election in the riding of Winnipeg South. Michael Chong is the Conservative candidate for re-election in the Ontario riding of Wellington Halton Hills. And Angela McEwen is the NDP candidate in the riding of Ottawa Centre. It's good to see you all. Uh, Mr. Chong, let me start with you. Uh, job creation and sick leave, uh, key campaign issues today. Let's talk about the plans to get people back to work because that's one of the big drags on the economy, as you know, because of the pandemic. As businesses reopen, they're struggling to find workers. Your party leader today promised a Conservative government would pay 25 to 50 percent of the company uh, wages of new hires. The Liberals have a wage subsidy plan in place until the end of October. How would this be different? Well, this would be put in place after the emergency programs that you're referencing have expired. As you've mentioned, millions of Canadians have lost their jobs during this pandemic. Many, millions more are struggling to find the same kind of work that they had previously, particularly women and younger workers. And so we're proposing to put in place an incentive for new hires uh, that would provide a subsidy for new hires, net new hires. Mm -hmm for up to six months uh, once these benefits, these emergency programs expire. We think this is a way to jumpstart the economy. It's part of our recovery plan uh, from the pandemic. Uh, Mr. Duguid, the Liberal Wage Subsidy Plan, as we've pointed out, expires uh, at the uh, end of October. Companies have to prove their losses to get it. The, this Conservative plan would be open to all companies. So what's your reaction to what the Conservatives have on offer here? Well, we, uh, we have the hiring recovery uh, benefit, uh, which we will be implementing, which will pay 50% uh, of an employer's uh, costs to bring a new employ employee uh, aboard. And, and we've also announced uh, some major support for our very hardest hit uh, sectors, such as the, the tourism industry. Uh, the wage subsidy and uh, other programs will be in place uh, till next year. And uh, so uh, we are we are really, um, you know, supporting our economy. I think we're at 840 thousand jobs in terms of recovery. Uh, our goal is a million and more, and we are going to get there. OK, uh, Angela McEwen, what's the NDP plan to get the economy back on track? And uh, what do you make of the, uh, of the announcements today from the Conservatives? Sure. So the, the NDP plan is to invest in climate action and to invest in the care economy to create a million new jobs. Uh, this is what we think is really important as we're coming out of the pandemic. We want to think about uh, what kind of economy do we want to have? What kind of future do we want to have? And we've seen that we've underinvested in the care economy. So it's really important in order to get women and young people back to work to have affordable child care in place. And it's really important to have enough workers trained up uh, to replace the health care workers who are burning out. Uh, and so we made an announcement yesterday around training for health care workers and nurses these are pieces that are really important that are missing from the other party's plan. The Liberals' uh, plan on the wage subsidy, we told them that if they didn't put strings on the wage subsidy, it would go to big businesses and they would pay out, uh, continue to pay out big bonuses and uh, dividends to shareholders. And that's exactly what happened. So they were spending money in the wrong place. We need to really focus it on creating new jobs for, for workers and supporting those okay. new um, economy coming back. Mr. Duguid, let me go back to you here. Your party's promising 10 days of paid sick leave for all federally regulated workers if you're uh, re-elected. But that only covers a relatively small number of workers. What about the rest of Canadians who don't have paid sick leave? Well, uh, we believe uh, 
by uh, we believe in leading by example and so the prime minister was in uh, winnipeg today he not only brought uh, much needed rain but he brought this uh, good news about uh, pledging 10 days of paid sick leave for all federally regulated uh, employees. And uh, also, uh, the Prime Minister pledged that he will immediately convene uh, both provinces and territories to uh, discuss a, a, an across-the-board program, because, of course, uh, this is uh, primarily provincial uh, jurisdiction, but we believe in in leading by example, and uh, we want safe workplaces. Uh, we want to protect those uh, frontline workers who have done such a great job for well, us. I guess I'm wondering why, uh, why, why the prime minister didn't pursue this track earlier. I mean, we're 18 months into the pandemic. Uh, why not a meeting earlier with provinces to try and push for paid sick leave? Well, I think we've learned a lot of lessons uh, throughout uh, the pandemic. We did, uh, as a federal government, offer uh, 10 uh, paid uh, sick days. Uh, we needed uh, provincial partnership uh, for that. Uh, that was, uh, in some cases, uh, pretty rough going with, with some of the provinces, but now is the time uh, to lead by example. We will lead, uh, again, this uh, First Minister's Conference to discuss this issue in detail, and hopefully yeah. it, it can be put I, in place. I, I think board. the provinces that came on site, it was three three paid sick leave days, but let, let me go to Angela McEwen. Uh, Angela McEwen, then Mr. Strong to you. Uh, what's your response to the paid sick leave offer from the Liberals today? Well, I, I had exactly the same response as you did, Peter. Why didn't they do this 18 months ago? I am a labor activist and we have been campaigning for the past 18 months saying one of the biggest things we can do to stop the pandemic is to make sure that workers have paid sick leave so they can stay home when they're sick, so they can afford to quarantine. And so the program that we have in place, at least it's something that the, the two weeks of sick leave um, through basically a CRB equivalent, but you, it really didn't work for workers because it didn't cover your pay immediately. Um, it didn't uh, kick in unless you were missing for three days of the week. So if you were just, you know, wanting to take that day off for testing because you felt sick right. and you wanted to make sure you weren't exposing your coworkers, it didn't work for that. So what we need is employer mandated paid sick days and we need job protected paid sick leave. So this is great. This is something we need. But why didn't they do it 18 months ago? All right, Mr. Chong, let, let me hear you on this. Uh, where's your party on the notion of, of a broader paid sick leave program and on the announcement today? Well, on the announcement today, I, I think it won't be consequential. And the reason is quite simple. 90% of Canadians work in provincially regulated workplaces. And today's announcement covers federally regulated workplaces, uh, which only covers 10% of the workforce. Mm -hmm. Those uh, That workforce is in sectors like the airline sector, the telecommunications sector, the banking sector. And the reality is that the vast majority of companies in those sectors already provide paid sick days. Um, the banks, the airlines, the big railway companies already do that. So it's not an announcement that's going to change much. We think a better approach is to extend parental and bereavement benefits for all Canadians, uh, to expand the employment insurance sickness benefits uh, that are currently in place uh, to help Canadians who are suffering from illness or who have a loved one that is suffering from illness or who un unfortunately have a loved okay. one that may have passed away. We think that's a better approach. It's a more universal approach and we think it will cover workers in both provincially and federally regulated sectors. All right, let, let me move on to another topic here. Angela McEwen, let me let me start with you here. Your leader, Jagmeet Singh, was in Saskatchewan today visiting the Cowessness First Nation and the site of the 751 unmarked graves there at the site of a former residential school and pledging to work with Indigenous communities. We, we, we saw an emotional NDP leader today uh, dealing with this situation uh, and promising to accelerate reconciliation. So. Um, what would the NDP do differently from what the Liberals have been doing on the on the reconciliation file? Well, the Liberals have been taking survivors to court. So when they were talking about uh, when Trudeau was visiting a, a grave site, uh, they were also in court fighting survivors to make sure that survivors didn't get the records that they need to know what happened to them at those schools. There are records that the federal government holds that they're, they're keeping from survivors. There are records that uh, the church holds that the federal government will not enforce uh, human rights tribunal case, uh, 
cases saying that, that, that the church needs to hand those over. Um, they're also not paying out settlements. They're taking survivors to court in order to avoid paying out settlements to survivors uh, who have waited for years often uh, to be able to have this. And so so you, your party would move all of that forward more quickly? Okay. We'll move it forward. Yeah. They're not moving it forward at all. They're stalling. Okay. okay. Mr. Chong, uh, how would the conservative relationship, uh, how would the relationship between Indigenous people and the federal government change under a conservative government led by Aaron O'Toole? Well, I, I think it ha first has to be said that we were all shocked uh, when these unmarked graves were discovered um, in recent months. And I think there's responsibility to be borne by all parties and by all uh, leaders uh, in our nation on this issue. Um, it's not just uh, something that's taken place in the last six years under the current government. This is something that uh, previous governments uh, have a responsibility to speak to as well. Uh, what we are proposing to do is first and foremost, uh, form a partnership with Indigenous peoples throughout this country, uphold their treaty rights as guaranteed under the Constitution and under individual treaties. More specifically, we are committed to fulfilling the Truth and Reconciliation's calls to action, specifically their calls to actions numbers 71 through 78, which deal with unmarked graves, uh, ensuring that unmarked graves are documented, ensuring that there is a formal registry so that loved ones and descendants of those lost uh, through the residential school system uh, can be found and commemorated, uh, and ensuring that uh, appropriate monuments are put up uh, to commemorate uh, okay. this tragedy. So th that's specifically what we are committed to doing right. uh, that has yet to be by the current government. Sure. Uh, Mr. Duguid, what's the Liberal plan for moving forward with reconciliation uh, at this point? Well, as our Prime Minister has said, no uh, relationship is more important than our relationship with uh, Indigenous peoples. So you heard uh, Minister Bennett uh, the other day announce $321 million to assist in the, in the search uh, for uh, the lost uh, children to bring them home. Uh, we are working with the National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation, which happens to be in my home riding mm -hmm. of, of Winnipeg South, uh, have eliminated uh, over 100 drinking water advisories, $18 billion in the 2021 budget for housing, health and other important needs for Indigenous peoples and, and making uh, those uh, investments on a distinction basis, uh, First Nations, Métis, and, uh, and Inuit. All right, all right. Uh, lots to cover in the days ahead here, but I want to thank you all for your uh, time with me tonight. Appreciate it, and uh, we'll have a chance to talk again, I hope. Good luck to all of you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Let's bring in our panel of parliamentary journalists now to discuss where we are after six days of the campaign. Susan Delacourt is a columnist with the Toronto Star. Joël Denis Bellavance is the parliamentary bureau chief for La Presse. And John Iveson is a columnist for the National Post and parliamentary bureau chief for Post Media. Good to see you all again. Uh, Susan, here we are almost a week into the campaign. How would you assess the campaign so far? Uh, you, you remember a week ago we were wondering when will this campaign ever start? Now I'm sort of feeling, when will it ever end? It does feel like it's been a very long week. Um, I, I thought it was interesting, the, the Prime Minister, or the Liberal leader, was asked on the road today, what's the point of this campaign anyway? And he had not a bad answer. Uh, we are in an election. Um, I don't know that people are overly fussed or paying attention to it. I don't think a ballot box issue has emerged. I think I wrote this week about how for the for Justin Trudeau, uh, I think he's learning this week because of Nova Scotia, because of the polls tightening, that he's right. going to have to fight really hard for this one. Okay, uh, John, what are your uh, what's your assessment of uh, six days of the campaign so far? Uh, what do you take away from it? Well, I think Susan's hit the nail on the head. Nobody's paying that much attention. Nothing. Uh, I think is going to this happened this week is going to make that much difference in September 20th. I would say that uh, mandatory vaccines was was probably a good moment for a couple of days for Trudeau. Um, I think daycare come for the liberal the Conservatives to come out and say they're going to cancel daycare probably not a, a a positive move for them. But I think generally the population is slightly irked that they were in an election. They're seeing things like Afghanistan that are clearly. Mm -hmm momentous things and yet we're in a, an election that really isn't about anything and they're being forced to make a decision they probably don't want to make. Joel Denis, uh, let me get your observations. 
Well, uh, Mr. Trudeau called this election, but uh, the, the sense that I have is that he was the less ready to uh, go for a campaign. The other three parties, the main parties, I would say the Bloc Québécois, the Conservative Party and the NEP, and to some extent the Green Party, were more ready than the Liberal Party to fight this election, to launch their campaign. I'll give you this example. The Conservative Party launched their platform on day two of this campaign. I've been talking about what they proposed to do. The NDP did that last week before the election was mm. called. And we don't know when the Liberal will uh, uh, launch their campaign. I'm told they're waiting just prior to the French debate of TVA on September 2nd just to put some more uh, um, things in the window. But so are you, I, I are you, are you saying they're, 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 they weren't ready for the campaign or they have a strategy that uh, wants to wait to, to roll out all the goodies at once closer uh, to debate nights? Well, it, it gives a sense that because they called the election, I was expecting them to be roaring, right. you know, be being first out the gate. But I, that's not the sense I'm getting watching them, uh, all the parties fighting this election so far. All right. Uh, Susan, look, lo lots of expectations of uh, leaders in an election campaign. Um, walk me through what you're what you're seeing here and, and, and what you think of, of the performances so far of, uh, of the three main party leaders, Trudeau, O'Toole and Singh. I say for all of them, it's a bit mixed. Um, I think Singh is probably doing the best of all of them. He's certainly doing better than he did in 2019. He's introduced, he's more comfortable in front of the cameras. He's got a new baby coming. He's a dad. He's, um, and I, I think he's been very strong. I, I agree with John and Joe Denis that the prime minister has baffled me a bit because he's running a front runners campaign. Uh, when clearly he's better ca campaigner as an underdog. Uh, so he's, he's good when he's in the corner, uh, mm. to use a boxing metaphor. <laughs> um, the, the, uh, the conservative leader, Aaron O'Toole, I think he looks like he's ready. I think he's, he's been prepared. He, he was ready for the answers for the questions on abortion and pro-choice. He's, uh, the platform is big. It's large. It looks like a lot of thought went into it. I was a little baffled by how much time he's spending in hotel ballrooms. Uh, but uh, again, that's uh, the virtual nature of this campaign. I agree with JD. Of all the parties, it looks like the, the liberals are, are sort of taking a more leisurely approach to this one with the release of their platform and, and, and treating it very traditionally when I, it, it should not be a traditional campaign. John, let me get your thoughts on uh, what you've seen from the leaders so far as the campaign is uh, six days in here. Well, that point on the platform, the Liberals might be uh, pretty happy that they haven't released their platform because the Conservative one was, was so uh, comprehensive. And one of the pledges in the Conservative platform was that they're going to increase the escalator on health care transfers mm -hmm. from 3% to 6%. That's a $60 billion commitment. Now, he is going to take away the $30 billion in daycare, but $60 billion in health care. And we've just seen a Nova Scotia election where health care was the predominant issue. In, in Nova Scotia, people thanked the Liberals for what they'd done during COVID, but said, we're looking forward and we want more money in health care. And that's what O'Toole's offering. So mm -hmm. I think the, the Liberals are probably working on their platform and probably uh, either matching or trumping that, uh, that commitment. Yeah, quickly on the performance. Uh, who, 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 what, what, who's standing out for you? Who's making you wonder a little bit? Well, I think well, you know, Trudeau's I, had a... Oh, hang on, J.D., coming so, to you next, just quickly to John on this. Yeah, I, I think uh, uh, Trudeau still has the fire. He still has tremendous energy. I mean, I've always been impressed by how much energy he has. Uh, but he's gaffed a couple of times. I mean, the thing on the, the Bank of Canada, I mean, it's the government that set, that's provides the Bank of Canada with its target rate, and he's just dismissed that And it would, while inflation's a big deal. And, um, you know, I think that uh, O'Toole's done pretty well. He looks fit. His, his French is pretty good. He's done a good job. All right. Uh, J.D., your assessment of the leaders so far? Well, I would agree with those points, and I would point out something that uh, both Jagmeet Singh and Aaron Utwell have been talking about pocketbook issues, the cost of living. And I think this might be the ballot question that will have to be uh, on, on September 20th, 22nd, 20, 20th sorry. Um, I, I think this will be uh, what people are looking for, pocketbook issues like the cost of housing, uh, the cost of living. And, uh, and, and inflation and all that. So uh, Mr. Trudeau has to come up with uh, convincing policies to be able to match 
what has been put forward so far by the NDP and the Conservative Party. Yeah, we talked about, Susan, quickly, you touched on the search for a sort of ballot question, but uh, it, could this be a challenge for, for Justin Trudeau? I mean, the ballot question was supposed to be framed before the election started. Who do you want, who do you want to lead you out of the pandemic? If it's become uh, more intricate than that, about uh, pocketbook issues and, and housing, and it's really not about uh, the fight over the pandemic, could that be a challenge? Uh, definitely. But, uh, it, you know, the, the Liberals will not be unprepared for this. I think uh, it's true we're waiting to see their platform, but I don't think this one's going to catch them unawares. Um, it, it just looks like they're holding their fire on it. Uh, John, what are your thoughts on that in terms of, uh, you know, uh, what the ballot question might end up being and uh, who will get to frame it? Well, I think, you know, the, 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 the polls are tightening. It looks like it's going to be a race. I mean, we... We in the media help make it a race. We we don't want it to be a, a shoe in from day one, and um, and that's what's happening. And if I was Erin O'Toole, I'd be slightly concerned that the polls are narrowing a little bit too early because I do think that things are not really going to um, make a difference until after Labour Day. And I, but I do think that that the idea that this is about the the, the pandemic, uh, Nova Scotia suggests, is not right. And maybe um, you know healthcare is could be the predominant one. Right, and uh, and yet JD, there's still lots to watch in terms of. Uh, in terms of the possible flare-ups of the fourth wave. It could be about the pandemic again, but uh, it may not. I mean, this could go two ways, right? If you're Justin Trudeau, if the pandemic flares up, uh, it could be why are we having an election again? Or if it flares up, uh, there could be some uh, people saying, look, uh, let's, stick with the, uh, let's stick with the party that handled the first, you know, uh, first waves of the pandemic uh, going forward. So lots to consider there. Absolutely. And that's a good point that you're making. If the pandemic the cases rises again. Some some people might tempted to blame the prime minister for calling an election when he didn't have to. So this uh, the mood of the people might be very unpredictable. And I've been saying that for a few months. I think this election will show that the mood of the electorate is very unpredictable. What we expected would happen on on voters uh, during the voting day uh, may not be what we uh, expected. Susan, let, let's uh, let's finish on this. Uh, Justin Trudeau, is, uh, and I've been watching it pretty closely, unless I missed something, hasn't said a negative word about uh, Doug Ford, hasn't said anything about uh, the way <laughs> Quebec is being managed these days, but he seems to have lots to say about, about Jason Kenney out in Alberta. What's the strategy here? Well, my colleague Rob Benzie had a great story earlier this week about that there is a non-aggression pact mm. between Doug Ford and, uh, and Justin Trudeau. And I think that, you know, national unity was such a big issue in 2019. And a lot of the battening down the hatches that the government did before this election was with the provinces, the negotiations with the child care deals, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I think the, the prime minister has bought himself some peace there so that he can focus on his opponents. Uh, what do you think of uh, the, 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 I guess, the unity piece of the election story, John, and how so far things seem to be pretty good unless you're, uh, unless you're Jason Kenney coming under fire from Justin Trudeau. Yeah, well, I mean, unity with, with Quebec is not an issue. All uh, three of the major parties, I guess four of the major parties, yeah. are falling over themselves to, to uh, fit <laughs> um, the, the Quebec premier. Um, they don't seem to be too worried about uh, Quebec, uh, Albertan independence and, and, and nationalism. Maybe they should be a little more. Uh, Joel Denis, let's finish with you and your thoughts on uh, that, particularly in Quebec, I guess. And... Uh, you know, we, we, uh, Yves-Francois Blanchet, the bloc leader, gets asked this a lot in the campaigns, is why would people need to vote for the bloc when, uh, when Quebec's getting everything it wants from Justin Trudeau? That's a good point. And Mr. Blanchet had to uh, difficulty answering that question. Now, uh, federal provincial relationship will be uh, the forefront soon because François Legault is uh, sending a letter to all party leaders asking uh, with his demands that become a tradition in Federal election, the Quebec mm -hmm. Premier presents some demands and wants some answers from the federal party. So I expect that to become a hot issue in Quebec in the next few days. But on the federal provincial front, I uh, heard from sources that Mr. Legault is uh, pretty active on the phone for one reason. He did not uh, really like the promises made by Mr. Trudeau to invest in long term care and impose national norms. And he's making the phone call rounds to convince the other premiers to denounce that. So we'll see where it lands. But that's what the situation is in Quebec right now. All right. Six days down and uh, 30 more to go. Uh, thank you all for your time this evening. We'll talk again. Everybody take care. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, Peter. That's all for this edition of Primetime Politics on CPAC. I'm Peter Van Dusen from all of us here. Thanks for watching. Until next time.